First Chronicles, chapter 15, beginning at verse 28, and going on down to First Chronicles, chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. First Chronicles, chapter 15, beginning at verse 28. And the Bible says, Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with what? Shouting and with the sound of the coronet and with the trumpets and with the cymbals making a noise with psaltery and what else? The next verse. And it came to pass as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looking out at the window, saw King David dancing and playing, and she despised him in her heart. Verse 1, chapter 16. And so, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and so they brought the ark of God into the midst of his tabernacle, that David had erected for it. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Presence, presence before praise. Presence before praise. Father, we open your word today. I ask and I pray as I open my mouth that you will open my mind and open our hearts so that the words that I will speak from my mouth and the meditation that we will receive in our hearts that together they both will be acceptable in your sight because you only, alone, you are our rock, our shield, our strength, and our redeemer. And let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. I came a little, a day earlier, uh, because yesterday was a holiday and I wanted to do some business. And I had, I had the occasion to go to a particular business establishment to take in some paperwork to file a claim. And uh, I haven't been to that place from before COVID. So I, I went and I parked and I, I saw the, 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 the big door. And I, 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 for a second, I wondered if I was at the right place because they had changed up the colors. And you couldn't see inside, but on the door was a graphic of the business and all the, the, the signs and everything. Say, so, yeah, I said, yeah, I'm at the right place. So with the confidence that I was at the right place, I boldly opened the door and went inside. And normally, before COVID, I would just stop at the receptionist's desk and sign my name. And then I will proceed to the elevator to go on the other floor. When I got to the receptionist's desk, I didn't see a book or register the sign. So I proceeded to reach behind me to touch the elevator to go upstairs. Then the security guard said, no, customers are not allowed upstairs anymore. I said, what? <laughs> Customers are not allowed upstairs anymore. I said, I have business to do, and I normally go upstairs. He said, sir, customers are not allowed upstairs anymore. And foolish me, I had to slap my head in my mind. Because I remembered that we are under COVID protocols. So he said, because of COVID protocols, customers are not allowed upstairs anymore. So I said, anyhow, I have some documents. I need to give it to someone. 
uh, and he said, well, you could sign your name here. He pulled out the book, sign your name here, and leave your documents at the refund desk. So I said in my mind, you are a security. You are not the receptionist. I need to make sure that I speak with someone who is a receptionist or who can help me with my situation. He assured me, he said, sir, once you leave it here, the relevant people will be able to get to it. So I left the documents and exited the building and turned around and looked back at the entrance door. It was a big double door and I remember, I remember saying, I'm thankful that even in the midst of COVID, they may not allow you upstairs because of COVID protocols into an office where they could deal with your situation. But I'm thankful that even in the midst of COVID, that I have a place that I could go, that COVID protocols does not stop me from going not upstairs into a business establishment, but COVID protocols does not stop me from going into the very presence of God. The, the, uh, the, the, the Apostle Paul says, and I'm here to say today that I don't know what you're going through. If you have a need, if you have a situation, you can come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy and you can find help in your time of need. We can enter into God's presence by faith, not having to worry about COVID protocols and enter into the very presence of God by faith. So David says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. I wish someone could say amen that when you're going through your situation, you have someone you can go to. My desire with all that's happening is to be in the presence of God. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, I, uh, Pastor Price, my colleague in ministry, we went to school together and uh, it's good for the members to be sometimes in the presence of the pastor. But it's even better to be in the presence of God. Listen, when I, when, when I come to church, uh, I don't come to be in the presence of anyone. I don't come because of who's preaching. I, uh, uh, let, 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 let me, let me, let, I don't come uh, 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 because uh, of who's singing. Uh, when you come into the place of worship, the, the person that you ought to be concerned about is God. The Bible says enter into his gates, not Pastor Burroughs' gates, not Bethany's Seventh-day Adventist gates, but you are coming into the very presence of God. I wish someone in the Bethany church could say amen today. Enter into the very presence of God. And into his courts with praise. You see, see, there's a difference. There's a difference between thanksgiving and praise. We thank God for what he has done for us. Uh, I don't know about you, but you can find at least something today that you can thank God for. Uh, uh, you don't have to search too hard. The mere fact that you can hear me means you're alive. You can thank God for that. Uh, you can thank God that you're in your right and your sound mind. You can find at least something to give God thanks for. So you thank God for what he has done. But you praise God because of who he is. Let me, let, me, let me say that again. Let me say that again. You see, because even if you say there's nothing that you have to thank God for, you can still praise God 
Because he is God. Uh, he is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is all wise. Uh, 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 he is God all by himself. Uh, uh, he, is not just, he is not just faithful. He is just. He is holy. And the more you know about God, it's the more reason you have to praise God. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. See, it's not what I could get when I come to church, you know. Come on, somebody. It's what I could give. Uh, sometimes we come to church to get some stuff. Uh, I didn't mean to spoil your, your train of thought today, but, 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 but. Uh, Micah says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits to one me? In other words, what shall I give to the Lord when I come into the house of the Lord? Why? Because sometimes both of us can come to church, the same church, and sit in the same row. And each one of us have a different experience. It's because, why? Because when you come into the house of the Lord, you come expecting to give and not so much to receive. What do you have to bring to the Lord today? You see, the text suggests that you could enter into God's gates with something else other than thanksgiving. Let that one sink in. The text implies that you could enter into his gates with something else other than thanksgiving. You could enter into his thanksgiving with backbiting. Mm -hmm. You could enter into his courts with hatred. You could enter into his courts burdened because of lack of trust and faithfulness to God. So you could come to church with all of these things except thanksgiving. So David says, he says, implicitly enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Are you thankful today? Are you grateful today? When the Bible uses the term enter into his gates, and enter into his courts, it comes from the language of the sanctuary and the temple. One of, one of those times that I want us to consider for the moments that I have today is taken from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, where several times, several times beginning verse 8, at verse 8, the, 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 the writer of Chronicles says, records that the king David says, Oh, Give thanks to the Lord. Several times in First Chronicles chapter 16, beginning at verse 8, as a matter of fact, beginning at verse 7, it is a psalm of David that he left with Asaph. And he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Then he said in verse 34, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. So when you talk about the sanctuary, and when you talk about the tabernacle, it is, it is natural, uh, natural that you will enter with thanksgiving. And when they entered with thanksgiving, they brought a thank offering. We don't bring those kinds of offering in the sanctuary today, but what we have to bring is a heart of gratitude. I wish someone in the Bethany church could say amen today. We ought to bring a heart of gratitude when we come into God's presence. So you could praise, but you have to be thankful. So this particular chapter, First Chronicles chapter 16, this is the saga and the journey of the Ark of the Covenant. Beginning at verse 1 of, of First Chronicles chapter 16, the, the Bible says, So, so, they brought the Ark of the Covenant and set it in the midst of the tabernacle. So it said, this is significant because 
it means that the Ark of the Covenant was not there before. I hope you got that. Uh, you need to let that one settle. It means that the Ark of the Covenant was missing from the house of God. Uh, you didn't get that, you didn't get that, you didn't get that. It means because I had to bring it and set it in its place, it means that the place where it was was empty. So in the temple, the tabernacle, the tent, the Ark of the Covenant was missing. If you know anything about the sanctuary, and if you know anything about the Ark, the Ark was a symbol of the presence of God. It was just a chest, just four feet by two feet, by two feet, overlaid with gold. Inside the ark of the, inside the, 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 the tables of, of Ten Commandments, uh, the two tables of stones, it was covered with the mercy seat. It was placed in the most holy place in the temple. There were two cherubim, two angels who, who guarded it and oversaw it. And they gazed intently at it. And whenever they traveled, God gave them instructions of how to care for it. It was a symbol of the awe and reverence of God. It was missing. It was a symbol of the very presence of God. But the ark was not God. But it was to remind the people of God. Without the ark of the covenant, for the Israelites, the glory of God was no longer with the people of God. Presence before praise is the ark of the covenant at its rightful place. And when I talk about the ark of the covenant, I'm not talking about the physical ark. I'm talking about when you come into the church, do you know that you are in the very presence of God? You're not in the presence of the pastor or the elder or the praise team, but you are in the very presence of the almighty God. The ark was a symbol of God's presence because the Bible says God does not dwell in temples made with hand. Listen, you can't contain God in a box. Some people Try to put God in a box. But the ark was just a visible symbol of the presence of God. It is not God because God is bigger than our religious symbols. I wish someone in the church could say amen. He is bigger than the ark. He is so big that Isaiah says he sits on the circle of the earth. Heaven is his throne, and the earth is his footstool. He is so big that one song where he said, he plants his feet upon the seas, and he rides upon the storm. He is so big that another psalmist said, he dwells in light unapproachable. So the ark is just a symbol, but the ark was not God. Sometimes we get it mixed up. And the holy things, we think that they are God. But God is who God is. God is holy. And God gave us some symbols to remind us of who he is, but they are not God. So when they are not there, you're supposed to know that God is still God. I wish someone could say amen in the church today. Because you see, there were times when the ark was not with the people of God. 25 years, Bethany. 25 years. Are you sure after doing all that time that the ark of the covenant was with the people of God. Are you sure that you have the presence of God? Presence 
of God is most important. You see, the Ark of the Covenant, when David was uh, not, probably not even born yet, Samuel was a youth, and Israel was attacked by the Philistines. And Eli the high priest, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Eli the high priest, the Bible says, the Philistines attacked Israel during the time of Eli the high priest. 4,000 4, soldiers were killed. And it was clear that the Philistines would win the battle. So Hophni and Phineas were the sons of Eli. And Eli was the priest. And Eli was responsible for taking care of the temple and also for ensuring that the Ark of the Covenant was always in its place. So because Hophni and Phineas were familiar with holy things, they presume that because of who they were, the sons of Eli, they presume because every day they were in the temple. They presume because they were around holy things. And the Bible says without consulting God, without receiving any clear instructions from God, that they went into the temple. And they took out the ark. And the Bible says when they brought it to the battlefield, all of Israel began to shout. And the Philistines wondered what the shout was about. And someone said, because the Ark of the Covenant had come into the camp. Nevertheless, the Philistines summoned their courage. And the Bible says, they defeated the Israelites. They captured the Ark. And when news got back to Eli... Eli sitting at the gate waiting for news of the war. The Bible said he fell back, broke his neck, and died. But before he died, they brought news first that his sons, Eli and, sorry, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed in battle. And then they said the Ark of the Covenant was taken. And then Eli, when he heard that, he fell back, broke his neck, and died. And, and Phineas' wife was pregnant. And she gave birth, hard labor. And when the child was born, the Bible said, she whispered, she whispered, Ichabod, the glory has departed from Israel. With the ark in their possession, they thought that they would automatically win the fight. But the Bible says they were presumptuous. They took the ark and they took it to the camp of Isdod and put it in the temple. And the Bible says they set the ark of the covenant next to Isdod, Asdod, in the temple, the, the God of Dagon. And when they woke up the next day, the ark, the, 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 the idol, the idol of God Dagon, he had, uh, his hands were broken off. And they fixed him up. And the next day, when they came back, he was all broken up. Listen, uh, they had to stand him up and fix it. Listen, listen, if you have to stand up your God. Uh, God is the one that stands me up. Uh, when I'm feeling down and out, uh, he gives strength to the weak. And to them that have no strength, he increases in strength. If you have to stand up your God, you need to check who your God is. Uh, they have to stand up their God. If you have to fix up your God, God is not the one that fixes me up I'm that I, I don't need to fix up God God is the one that fixes me up I don't carry God God is the one that carries me so 
is King David now, King David is now solely in possession of the throne of Jerusalem. 20 years after the ark was taken, some say 40, 20 years after the ark was taken, when they took the ark, you know, they got so nervous, the Bible says that, that, that the, the men of Ashdod uh, and, and, and the temple and Dagon, uh, when they saw what happened, they got so nervous and then God sent a plague of hemorrhoids. Now, if you know what hemorrhoids are, and they got so nervous that they put the ark on a, on a, on a cart and they sent it off and they sent it with gifts and they sent it back to Jerusalem. Because why? They recognize that even though the people of God were not in favor with God at that time, they still couldn't mess with the people of God. That one is deep. Because sometimes, like the Israel ancient, they moved the ark without the permission of God and they suffered the consequences but nevertheless God was still faithful to them that God would still not allow their enemy to bring them down. As sometimes in life if you will admit it even when you are unfaithful to God hallelujah God is still faithful to you. And even when the ark was in the territory of the enemy, God had to still let the enemy know that they were still my people. What a mighty God we serve. So the Bible says, David now comes on the throne. First Chronicles chapter 15. David now comes on the throne. The Philistines are, were defeated. And the Bible says, and David built a house for himself in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent there. But before you get to verse 15, you see, this is the second time that David is attempting to bring the ark back into Jerusalem. The first time is in chapter 13. David, chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible said David consulted with who? The captains and the thousands and every leader. David consulted leaders with the captains and the thousands. Verse 1, chapter 13. I need you to see it. Chapter 13, verse 1. First Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 1. David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. Something is missing in that text. But he never consulted with God. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is out of, of, of the Lord our God, let us send out of our brethren everywhere, who are left in the land of Israel and with them to the, to, the prophet, to the priests and the Levites who are in their cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us, verse 3, bring the ark of God back to us for we have not inquired of it since Saul. Then all 
of the assembly said that they would, they would do so for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. I wish it was on the screen, but, but they find it. They said it was right in all the eyes of the people. So David, king of Israel, just 30 years old, Pastor Craig, David consulted with all the elders, all the church board, had a church business meeting, and all the people agreed to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. But David, king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, never consulted with God. Uh, you, need, you, need, you, need, you, need to let, you need to pause right there. You need to pause right there. David never, he called everyone else. How did that list mean none? What's up? Call a church board on Zoom. Call a church business meeting in person. And every step of the way, they agreed. But the one thing that was missing, he never got a declare direction from God. And the Bible says, all the people gathered. They went up to Karath Jerem which belonged to Judah, to bring up the ark of God, the Lord who dwells between the cherubims, where his name is pronounced. The Bible says in verse 7, watch it, in verse 7 of 1 Chronicles chapter 13, so they carried the ark of God on a new car. See, you need to understand, when the enemies sent the ark back to Israel. They sent it on a cart. So when David now goes to retrieve it, he says, listen, I'm not going to put it on that cart. I'm going to put it on a new cart. But David had to realize that you have to be careful of new stuff. Because God already said, when you're carrying the ark, only the Levites ought to carry the ark. I wish someone could go with me today. And he already said that when they carry the ark, they ought to carry it with two poles through four corners, and they ought to carry it on their shoulders. God already said that. So no matter how much new cart, you want to bring if it's contrary hallelujah to the word of God then God's presence is not in it and let me break that down again let me break David put it on a new card no matter the newness of the card it was contrary to the instructions of God and not only that David did not even allow the Levites to carry it. all the men carried the ark Contrary to God. So the Bible says, so now they're bringing the ark up and David, and the Bible says, and when David, verse 8, all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps and on string instruments and tambourines and on cymbals and with trumpets. And when they came to Kedron's threshing floor, Uzzah put his hand to hold the ark for the oxen had stumbled. They're carrying the ark on a new cart. Contrary to God's instructions. They began to shout 
and dance and sing prematurely. But they did not have the presence of God. Presence before praise. So when Uzzah struck hold his hand to steady the ark, the Bible said he was struck down right there. Why? The, 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 the oxen had stumbled. Whenever we try to do some things, that are contrary to whatever God says that we should do. You're going to stumble in your own path. The oxen stumble because they thought that they were doing a right, a good thing, but they were not doing the right thing. You could do a good thing, but if it's not the right thing, the oxen would stumble. I often wonder why. I say, God, God, you're so harsh. You're so harsh. I mean, uh, all he did, all he did, all he did, Brother Forbes, all he did was that he reached out his hands to stop the ark from falling. But that was not his place because he shouldn't have been there in the first place because he was not from the tribe of Levi but because he was in the house of Abadam who was his father like Eli's son Phenai and Hophni he got familiar with holy things you can have holy things all around you you can even have the ark in your presence but if you are not filled with the presence of God if you are not covered with the glory of God, you could be touching holy things but not filled with the presence of God and you and also was not filled with the presence of God and the Bible says God struck him dead right there. So David got angry with God. Verse 11. David got angry with God because the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. Therefore, the place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God, saying, How then, how then can I get the ark back into the house of God? Watch this now. So the Bible says, David, this is the Bible, the Bible says, David, in verse 13, David would not carry the ark into the city of David but he took it into the house of Obed Edom the Gittite and the Bible said David was so afraid he said listen 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 he say, I don't know what, what God up to I don't know what God is into but I thought I was doing God a favor and uh, he struck down my, my right hand person in the name of Uzzah Say, Lord, if you're going to do that to me and to us, then, then I might as well just, just, just leave the ark right here and not continue. But you see, uh, God never told David to move the ark in the first place. David took it upon himself to call a church meeting and they decided to move the ark. And when it didn't work out, David, a man after God's own heart, says, I'm going to leave it right here in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. If you don't know that, he was a, he was a, a proselyte. He was, he was not originally an Israelite, but he was from the, from the, from the tribe of the giants of Gath. And he, he became... Uh, uh, to know God through the Israelites and David said I'm going to leave it there in his house and the Bible says hallelujah the Bible says in verse 14 and the ark of God remained with the family of Eder, Obed Edom in the house three months and the Lord blessed the house of 
obeyed Edom and all that he had. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, David didn't receive the blessings at that time because they went contrary to God. But there's blessings in the ark of God and those that God found favor with, the Bible said he blessed the entire host of Obed-Edom. Uh, watch it now, coming down to the final part of it. So when David heard that, someone sent him a message. Twitter, WhatsApp, wherever you they sent him a message. And they said, listen, 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 David. I am down here at the house of Obed-Edom. And blessings are flowing all around. And David said, the ark should not be there, but it should be in Jerusalem. So the Bible says, in, verse, in chapter 15, David now is making a second attempt. This is where I want to get to. David now, now look, how, look how things change. Look how things change. Number one, he prepared. Verse one. He prepared not just a home for himself, but verse 1 of chapter 15, 1 Chronicles, he prepared an ark. He prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. And then the Bible says, then David said in verse 2, watch it now. He said in verse 2, no one may carry the ark of the covenant except whom? The Levites. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark and to minister before him forever. David, the king of Israel, had to know that God did not call him for that assignment. God had called the Levites. But because he was king, he thought that he could bypass God's uh, special instructions and do it. See, sometimes in the church, Bethany 25th anniversary, we think that because we have such and such position and status that we could do what we want to do in the name of doing good. But David, even though he was king, God did not call him the border with the ark. God had already appointed the Levites. You have to know your role and your function and responsibilities in the church. God called him to be king. God didn't call him to do evil holy things. I wish you had two witnesses in the Bethany church today. So when he realized that, he switched. And he said, no one, not even the king, may carry the ark, but only the Levites, for the Lord had chosen them. And then he said, he gathered all Israel together to bring up the ark to its place, which he had prepared. He prepared a place. And then we go down to verse, verse, verse 13. Verse 13. David recognized what he did wrong the first time. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. That's deep. David, that's why, that's why you got to love David, you know. Despite what he did, he was still a man after. David says, listen, right in front of the church. He said, church, we made a mistake. We made a mistake. Uh, we tried it the first time, but that was not the proper order. So I'm coming back to the church again to let you know that this is not, that's not the proper order. This is the right way. So I'm going to put it in the hands of the Levites. Because God had already said that it's the Levites who were to bring in the ark. And they were to bring it on their shoulders. So fast forward. So now the ark is on its way to Jerusalem in the place that David prepared for it. 
And the Bible says in verse 28, coming on down, coming on down, verse 28 of First Chronicles, the Bible says, Then all of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord of the covenant with shouting, praise, presence before, praise. This time now, it's praise after presence. Because after they realize that they are in the presence of God, after they realized that God had approved their plans, after they realized that they were carrying the ark the right way, after they realized, then the Bible says they began to praise God with shouting, with the sound of the horn, with the trumpets, and with the harps. And the Bible says, and David got so excited, he is now the king of Israel. And he is now leading the procession. The praise procession, Pastor Williams. He is now leading the praise procession. The Levites are behind him carrying the ark. Uh, he took his hand off the ark. He said, listen, I tried that already. Also died. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my, my hand off the Lord. I'm going to leave that to the Levites. And I'm going to move forward. I'm going to lead the people forward while they bring the ark. Behind. And the Bible says, David took off his, his, his kingly robes. Took off his kingly robes. And the Bible says he danced before the Lord. And the Bible says in another verse, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, not only did he dance before the Lord, he danced in a linen effort. The linen effort was the undergarments that the priest wore. Uh, some say he danced naked. He didn't really dance naked. He had on the ephod. The Levites had on the ephod. And he took off his kingly garments. Why? Because when he brought the possession enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise when he entered into the gates of Jerusalem he entered it but it was not it was not his party it was not his show the ark of the covenant representing the very character of God was finally making its way back from enemy territory making his way back into God's church. And David said, this is not about me. So I'm going to take off my kingly robes and I'm going to expose the same robes that the priest had so that the priest and all the people may know that it's not about me. I know that sometimes in the church, we bigger people. We bigger people. But when you come to worship God, all of us are wearing the same garments. I wish someone in the Bethany church could say amen. Uh, David realized that even though he was king, he was no better than the priest. He was no better than the common people. So he took off his priestly garments to say, listen, I'm on the same level with you. Why? Because in the church, there's only one person we ought to glorify. His name is Jesus. He's king of kings. Uh, he's Lord of lords. So David in another psalm says, lift up your heads, O ye gates. I'm bringing the ark back into the church. Lift up your heads, Bethany, on your 25th anniversary. The ark, God says, I'm going to bring it into the church. When God's presence comes into the church, listen, all of those things that we worry about, you know, See, we, 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 we praise God, but we still praise people. I praise God and I thank people because only God is worthy of my praise. So I don't want, when I come to church, I don't want you to pick me up, you know. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, what's happening in the religious circle today? We pick up too much religious leaders. I wish I had two witnesses in the church today. If David could take off his kingly garments, and be one with the people. Why? Because the king of kings. Oh lift up your heads. 
O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and let the King of glory come in. I wish someone could say amen in the Bethany church today. Lift up your hands, let the King of glory come in. Say, Lord, help me. Help me. You don't want to lift me up. Lift up Jesus. All the pastors that you mentioned, don't lift them up. Lift up Jesus. Don't lift up any human being. But lift up Jesus. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men. So David danced, took off his kingly robes, exposed himself. And Mikael, the daughter of Saul, his first wife said, said listen, uh, she despised him. And David had to remind us, listen, God rejected your father, my father-in-law, unfortunately. And because you despise me for praising God in the presence of God, the Bible says God cursed her. And she had no children, not in her lifetime. No more children until she died. That's an oxymoron because you can't have children after you die, but no more children. You understand? No more children or no children for the rest of her life. And then David set up the musicians because the presence of God had come into the sanctuary of God and he set up Asaph and he says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. I left that place that I told you about at the beginning with some apprehensions that maybe I will not hear from them concerning my matter. I left and I felt a way and I, I really wanted to make sure that I got those documents in the hands of the right people. I didn't want to leave it with the security because the security is the security. Security can't help me. His job is to secure and protect. He didn't know what my business was all about. And so I left, but I, 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 I left and I said, I'm going to wait until they contact me. Never got a chance to go upstairs where they look over my documents. So I decided to put my confidence for that moment in a man who was only a messenger. But then I read in the book of Micah that there's another messenger. He's not only a messenger in terms of carrying your messages to whom you wanted to go to, but he is the messenger of the covenant. His name is Jesus. He's not a security guard. He is the one who could deal with your situation. And he promised that he's going back to heaven to prepare a place. And while he is there, he's preparing, he's ministering before the Lord. So in Revelation chapter 11 verses 15, I got a glimpse. I got a glimpse. The Bible says, ah, when the seven angels sounded its trumpet, Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And then, when they jump on down, it says, and the temple was opened and there was seen in the temple the ark of the covenant. One of these days, one of these days by and by, I'm going to know for sure 
that I'm in the actual presence of God. 